Welcome to another episode of the Reboot Chronicles, a no holds barred forum with global leaders, authors, entrepreneurs, and CEOs about how organizations stay focused on growth and innovation in unprecedented times. I'm your host, Dean DeBias, coming to you live from Revive's North American headquarters in Chicago, and we would like to thank you for joining us from around the globe today. I'd like to welcome Greg Renfrew to the Reboot Chronicles, founder and executive chair of Beauty Counter, a high growth certified B Corp that is on CNBC's Disruptor 50, Fast Company's Most Innovated and Allure's Best Beauty List. The Carly Group recently acquired a majority stake in the company, valuing the business at probably around a billion dollars or so, but who's counting, right? Greg, it's good to see you. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, nice to see you as well. So much to talk about, Um, such an exciting time for you. Um, you know, you've been driving this company for almost 10 years, great growth machine, I kind of watched it from afar being a, uh, you know, startup guy myself and, uh, or person I should say these days, who knows. Um, and now you're almost headed into this hyper growth phase with Carlisle's investment and bringing in kind of the next level CEO, Mark Ray, all this stuff going on. It's, uh, to me, it's just as a serial CEO who's stepped into those roles before and help founders take it to the next level. To me, it's the most exciting phase. For others, it's always a you know, very questionable phase for founders. And I would just love to start out there kind of flipping the script here. It's like, you know, how did, you know, a little bit about how did you develop it to such a scale is, is always important. We'll talk about that most of the show, but it's just, how has it gone uh, recently? You know, how did you get to the point where like, hey, major investor, Carlisle, one of the best in the world, um, big deal kind of, um, of people that know how to uh, do high growth uh, companies, but you could have done all types of things. You could have done, uh, you could have sold it. You could have done an IPO or a SPAC. So how did you evolve to this phase with uh, Carlo? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think that, well, first of all, we had, we had had opportunities over the years to sell beauty counter to strategics and yeah, I, I felt uh, which was great. And we turned them down. And I did so because I really felt that we had the opportunity to be the next generation leader in beauty. I mean, it's time for a new crop of companies to emerge and be the next generation leader. So first and foremost, with my commitment to leading the clean beauty movement, a strategic, a strategic didn't feel like the right uh, avenue for us at the time we made the decision to go out and um, move towards you know a liquidity event last year, but it actually it's funny because it started uh, it started about eighteen months ago. I read Bob Iger's book, and I'm a big Bob Iger uh, fan. And I read his book Ride of a Lifetime, mm-hmm. and, and I've told him that there's sort of two things that really greatly impacted my professional career and personal life. One was my watching an inconvenient truth years ago. And the second time was when I read Bob's book. And what struck me while reading that book was when he took over the leadership position at Disney and started looking at acquisition and how they could really do something bigger than just build specifically on the Disney brand. I thought this is this is really interesting and I want to control the destiny of Beauty Counter and Counter Brands LLC, which always strives to sort of make the impossible possible. And so I felt that moving forward with a strategic I mean, sorry, with a financial investor, with a financial sponsor was the right way to go. And so, you know, 18 months or so ago, I went to my board and I said, this is the path that I want to take. And I want to look for a financial sponsor that sees the value in the enterprise that we've created, but also sees the vision I have for a future that is, you know, where all clean is clean beauty and all beauty is clean beauty, but also really believes in the power of people and community-based commerce. And so Carlisle was the absolutely perfect fit. And uh, the second part of your question is, you know, how did we get to where we are and how's it going? I think that, <laughs> you know, you know, not it's an easy, uh, not an easy answer. I know. No, I mean, look, it's been a long couple of years. Let's, I, I think anyone that doesn't, you know, that, that thinks that high growth businesses of at any stage are easy, not to mention that, you know, there, there've been a lot of things thrown in the world over the last couple of years. But I think that, I identified, I think one of my strengths at this point in time is I know where I'm strong, I know where I'm weak. And I think that I have great vision. I think I can be, have an infectious enthusiasm and passion for my business. I think I can be a strong leader um, and an inspirational leader, but I don't think I'm necessarily the best person to dot every I and cross every T to ruthlessly prioritize uh, strategies and to lead the organization in a very efficient way. And I think that's where bringing in Mark was an incredible opportunity for us because prior to the sale um, or the majority 
sale to Carlisle, we had identified a need for a really strong operator. And so was thrilled that Mark decided to join us and that he and I could really become a very formidable, you know, duo um, together using our inherent strengths and experiences to build the business. Yeah, yeah, that's a nice way to say it. I mean, it's right out of the Carlisle playbook. I mean, they, they know how to do this. And Mark did a great job at Sephora and other companies. I mean, the guy the guy gets, uh, he gets scale. And when you're talking hundreds of millions and doubling and tripling and then getting to be billion dollar, I'm not talking valuation from the revenue folks, um, it's a whole different game. So it's exciting. It's good to see. And, and it allows you to really focus on what brought you here, which is usually what gets lost, especially if you're required, which is the passion and the focus around not just clean and green uh, washing, but actually taking a leadership position in the industry and showing people the path to the point where the big box guys and the big brands who still struggle with it can actually say, oh, we need to get on track here because this is a formidable player. This isn't just a niche. You know, there's a lot of indie brands out there that are doing it. They're not right. scaling it. I don't think they're scaling it. I mean, we had Credo on the program before they've got their dirty list and all that stuff. And I think you have your own. I think yours is longer, actually. <laughs> well, well we green. start. Yeah, we were the first company that publicly published uh, our Never List. We did that back Never in list. that was it. Yes. 20, 2013 when we launched. And and um, some of the Credo um, team members are people that used to work for BD Counter, and they've done a, a really nice job. But yeah, I think look, you know, to to scale. I mean, I have a very bold vision for this brand and this movement, and to be able to bring in a strong operator like Mark to work side by side with them was great. It's hard as a founder to do this. I mean, I think I would be lying if I said it's not, it's easy to transition and give your baby over to someone else and release, you know, control to, to a large extent. But I think it's, it's a really important opportunity. Yeah, exactly. And, um, the other reason I liked it, uh, the, your approach, this goes back a couple of years, is you were one of the few ones that said, hey, okay, we're going to start out DTC, direct to consumer acronyms here, but you really became one of the first true omni-channel ones, which means you tried things, you took risks, you, so you know, you're in some big box stuff, you've got 50,000 consultants, it's a whole different model, you've just got these multiple tracks to attack the market, um, the you know IRL movement, I love the new hashtag, it's like in real life. Um, you know, kind of launching physical locations, maybe not a lot, but you've never, even prior to massive funding now, you've never been afraid to try things. And I, I really admire that. Well, thank you. I think that, you know, it's interesting because people have asked me why I chose the channels through which we've decided to distribute our products and, you know, how did we get here? I think for me, going back, you know, to late 2010, early 2011, when I concepted Beauty Counter, there were a couple of things that were happening. You know, first and foremost, I felt we had an important story to tell. Most Americans, even today, still have no idea that there are chemicals of concern <clears throat> in the products that they're putting on their bodies every day. So, I was trying to figure out, you know, how do we tell the story? I was speaking, I had a, I remember having a long conversation with Bill Guthy, who had built Guthy Ranker, talking to him about the sale of cosmetics and skincare online. And again, remember, this is 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And he was saying that it's great from as a replenishment vehicle, e-commerce is, but it's really challenging. And it's gotten much easier, obviously, but at the time to, to match a skin tone or to help people, you know, get the texture or the scent profile of a product was really challenging. And so in contemplating how to build the business, you know, I was meeting with a friend of mine who worked in an investment bank and she said, have you considered direct sales? To which I said, no, like, hell no. I don't know anything about direct sales. I come from retail and, you know, e-com, et cetera. But yeah. <clears throat> it was and interesting vision, to me. Visions of MLM stuff. Yeah, and it, you know, and I've never, yeah, and I've never had a particularly positive feeling about certain of those companies. I think that, I think that the industry at large has gotten a bad rap based on a few you know, players that, that don't operate in a great way. It's, it's too bad because I somehow we for, forgive all the financial institutions for their wrongdoing. But yet, if you're seeing a group of honest people trying to build a business together, it somehow is, is a bad thing because of, you know, one or two companies, you know, decades ago. But, but that aside, I thought, you know, this is really interesting. You know, our story is going to be best told person to person. We know that department store distribution of products is waning. We know that the incumbents control the shelves. And so, and we want to create an underground movement. And so we took right out of the gate, best in class attributes of traditional direct sales, e-commerce and retail to create a new type of direct to consumer brand that was really community based, but afforded our clients the opportunity to move between channels as they saw fit, because we, you know, you, you know, this, you can't dictate to consumers how they shop your brand today. And so that's, you know, exactly why I started building the business in the way that I did.
Yeah, you're a pioneer, really. I mean, everyone is just catching on to this. What do you think, what do you think of uh, groups like Ulta and Sephora embedding themselves in big box stores? It's, it's an old, I mean, my father was like one of the inventors of the license department back in the 60s, 50s, mm-hmm. for gosh sakes, bringing other companies into stores. So it's an old model, but I'm seeing a resurgence of it, especially in beauty. You know, it's interesting because you're right. You know, you saw Sephora go into JCPenney and yes, they've exited and now they've gone to Kohl's and you've got the partnership between Target and Alta. I mean, it seems to be working right now. I, you know, I don't know. My guess is, I'm probably be, you know, someone probably shoot me for saying this, but my guess is that the, the really big box guys, the Walmarts and the Targets, et cetera, they're trying to, you know, they're trying to go up against Amazon and trying to take control. And so partnership for them with incredible institutions like Alta and Sephora gives them a leg up. And I, but I think that they're probably thinking about their own domination more than they're thinking about, you know, what this means for Alta or Sephora. But I do think that, you know, it, it does, you know, I think we're, well, I think everyone knows this to be true. I think, you know, where you've seen Alta and Sephora really credibly play in prestige and luxury to some extent there, we are also seeing the targets and the Walmarts and others being able to meld into where, you know, luxury and prestige is going so that that same consumer, that client is shopping all of these places simultaneously. It allows them to bring the brands to life in a way that is really difficult to do purely online at an Amazon. And so I think it gives them, I think it gives them an opportunity to truly compete. Uh, But I think it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. I also think that, you know, no matter what's happened over the course of the pandemic or with all of the improvements vis-a-vis technology, I do think specifically women, but many people, we still like to touch and feel. We want that tactile experience. We want to be able to go into places and have some fun playing with makeup and skincare. And so I think- All about the senses, really. Yeah, so it gives you you that opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Now, I was just curious, is that might be something that you uh, would would consider? Because as you look at mass scale, you've got a pretty good portfolio. And how about, um, not to get too geeky here on sales channels, um, but- the, you know, you already mentioned MLM getting a bad rap for just a couple actors years ago, but how do you guys differentiate in that space, that direct selling model? Is it mostly moms or are you going, do you have a lot, do you have a lot of younger um, consultants now too? Gen Z you know, it's so, yeah, it's so interesting because I think just, just to, to sort of debunk the myth on MLM, which people don't even, I mean, when yeah, people talk it. about multi-level marketing, right, it is literally the same organizational structure as you enjoy in a traditional corporation. You have you know, you have the the sort of lower, the lower, younger, typically younger ranks that, have, that are at the entry level positions, and then you move up and there's more control at the top. And I think that and remuneration typically in corporations moves up as you get towards the top of the of the organization. So I'm not exactly sure where that rap comes from, except for there were some bad eggs back in the day, and, and there may be some today, but those that sort of are selling you a business opportunity versus selling you a product. And I think when you look at the spectrum of companies, you have those that are very focused on, I'm going to pay you a commission on the sale of a product. And for Beauty Counter, you know, the way that the women who, and men, but primarily women who represent us earn an income, if they do earn an income with us, is that they get paid a commission on the sale of products. And instead of paying that commission to a wholesale retailer, we're paying it to people. And when you build a team, you can get a small piece of that, of someone else's time, but it's a very small piece. And I think that that is something that I think that people get confused about how it actually all works. No, oh, and it's it's like, it's the gig economy now. Again, you're ahead of the game. But are, are, um, in terms of audience, are you, getting, are you getting a younger audience? Can you get them engaged? Uh, yes. More and more, and that's what I'm seeing mostly in your brand. And it's, uh, and um, so it's it's just interesting. I mean, as you kind of built this out, at least over the last five years, because you got to kind of a mass scale. What, what were what was your biggest reboot challenge that you? Uh, it's always fun to look back and laugh at, I guess. But maybe it's too close. Maybe you're not ready to. Laugh. <laughs> maybe yeah, it was last I, week. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, I'm going through those challenges, right? You've picked a great well, week maybe, to ask. Maybe that it's question. right after this call. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, well, first of all, to answer your question a moment ago, yes, we have been able to attract um, women and men of all ages, people of all ages. So we have some very young people. I think one again, one of the misconceptions um, about. Uh, beauty counter or direct sales is that it's like these people out there that live in this channel, they are 
primarily digital influencers, primarily micro, but some macro digital influencers who are lawyers and doctors and you've gone to Harvard Business School and are nurses and yes, stay-at-home moms and also people that just want a side gig because their professional career is paying them the bills, but isn't something that's, you know, that they're really passionate about. And so we get, I think because of our mission, because of our advocacy efforts in Washington, we're able to attract a whole bunch of people and they amplify everything that we're doing on a corporate level. And I think that it's an incredibly, they are an incredible asset to any brand. And I think that more brands should be thinking about community-based commerce. Um, but in terms of reboot and challenges, I mean, where do I even begin? I mean, every day is like a Mount Everest of challenge. I think over the last few years- Loaded, loaded you know, question, I know. Yeah, it's a loaded question. I mean, I think for me, you know, it is, first of all, meeting the ever-changing needs of consumers. They, they change constantly and they're always asking to do more. In fact, faster and better. And that's really difficult, especially when you've come through a pandemic where you have, you know, significant global supply chain issues. You have um, an incredibly exhausted group of corporate associates and independent consultants who have kind of gone through this sort of great resignation. But I think one of the things that's been really challenging for us is that because we're a community-based organization, you know, all of the um, challenges that we face as a, as a nation with our focus is on the fighting on politics and religion and race and, you know, um, vaccines and all the things that have been going on. I think that's something that's been a really big, a much greater challenge for me as a leader of a brand, but I think for many brands than anyone anticipated and trying to, to stand true to, you know, to really have your position and, and, to be able to be vocal about the things you stand for without alienating large groups of people and knowing that the community is important, especially for us, because our goal is to get safer, you know, beauty and skincare products into the hands of everyone. So we want to represent everyone. That to me has been a really, really hard thing to navigate over the last number of years. Yeah. You've got to represent everyone in, in years. And, you know, I love the, I mean, just, I was going to go into green there for a second, but what you just said is so important. It's like in the gig economy and finding these side roles, it is so important to find something that you are passionate about. So driving a lift car is not something people are actually passionate about. They don't really want to sit in the car all day, but they're making money. Whereas this are 20 other different products in different industries, you can actually get involved in um, marketing stuff that you really are passionate about. And you've got some very credible things to be passionate about. You know, the dirty, the, uh, the, um, you know, your, your list. list. Yeah, your never list. Sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> I think of Peter Pan when I say that. Um, it's uh, it's amazing how you know people will gravitate toward that. So my, my guess is your churn rate on people is probably pretty low once they get hooked on your stuff. Not customers, but your resellers. Well, both actually. I think you know at the end of the day, yeah, you know, point, when yeah. I started Beauty Counter, you know, we ain't, we really built the business on what I would sort of say is this trifecta of we educate and arm people with information so that they can make more informed choices about the products that they're using on their bodies and in their homes. We, you know, we've used commerce as an engine for change. We unapologetically, you know, sell amazing, mm -hmm. you know, high performance skincare, color, cosmetic, and personal care products, but we also focus on the safety of them and have a very comprehensive approach to that. And as importantly, we advocate tirelessly for cosmetic reform because we haven't updated a major federal law in the United States for 84 years. And when you put those three things together and you give an opportunity, you fill a need that someone has in their mind of what they want to be doing um, you know, in, in their career and, and allow them to participate in their democracy or be part of meaningful change. That's a very, very powerful opportunity for people. And I think most people are seeking some purpose beyond just, of course, we all need to make money, but how do you do it and have social impact simultaneously? It's exciting for people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Many brands have been um, started just by reading the labels of the products that they were using. Like one example was she was reading the label, she was on the program of, you know, a deodorant and you said, you know, that for some reason, deodorant shouldn't be affecting my liver. Why is this, why is this warning on here? Yeah. So I love how, um, you, you know, you weren't, this wasn't like you're calling the category. It was the function of making it a safer spot. And, uh, and I think, you know, kind of whatever it means, if it's, you know, driving the next, next level of, you know, regulation, that's, that's great. I think they've just ignored this category, but eventually that'll, that'll happen. What other trends do you see out there besides, you know, to me, the, the big stakes about the word clean and green should be obliterated with something more scientific because it's like really pure formulas versus overprocessed. So just learning how to scale, that's one thing. But if you look at the consumer facing stuff, um, personalization, um, men's brands, uh, things like that, what, uh, 
What are you excited about? What's next for you guys? Well, I do think that I am. I am to. I'm excited to to see someone put a standard in place that makes sense in terms of what is clean or pure. To your point, because I think there's a lot yeah. of ambiguity out there and there's backlash. And I think at the end of the a day, lot, a lot of greenwashing. Know, I, yeah, and, and there is greenwashing. And of course, and now we call. And now I'm, I, you know, our team calls it clean washing because there is no, <laughs> there are no standards, so you can say what you want. But you know, for me, and exactly. and I'm sure Carlisle will cringe as I say this, but I really meant this to be true, which is the world didn't need another beauty brand; it needed a movie. Movement, and we created that movement and we're really excited about it. I, I think in terms of where things are going or what I'm at least seeing, one, I think within beauty and in certainly in quote unquote clean, we're seeing a real emergence and in, in, um, in sort of, I think, hair. And, you know, so there's so their product thing standpoint, you know, you see hair emerging, you see the desire for people to have products that are multi-purpose. I think people are, and certainly younger generations are increasingly aware of the need to think about sustainability. I know that seems like an incredibly obvious statement, but it, it never ceases to amaze me how little people do think about sustainability. And so um, I think that you're gonna see um, in all products, but certainly in the beauty industry, a desire for less is more. How do I buy a purchase something that I can use in more ways than one? So multi-purpose things, you know, how do you personalize things? I mean, I do think we care about that. We're trying, you know, that's it's it's both exciting and challenging at times. Personalization and color and things like that is easy. You know, allowing someone to personalize the scent profile of a product or whatever is a little bit more complicated, but I think we're gonna need to go there at some point. Um, I do think that also, you know, I'm seeing a lot of a lot of people trying to navigate how do you create you know, sort of community-based commerce, how do you allow for, you know, two-way dialogue between the companies and their the clients that they serve, but also how do you create a dialogue between the, the clients and, and create a sort of ecosystem? And I think, you know, people love or don't love Peloton. I believe that they were really, did a really good job with that type of, you know, you know, people were communicating with one another, not just the brand to, to their clients. And I think you're going to see a lot more of that. And obviously, technology is going to play a really key role in, you know, how products are products are brought into the market and how people interact with the brands. You know, Peloton's a good comparable just in terms of the technology. So, you know, Ravid, the sponsor of this program, it's a personalized um, recommendation engine. So you take a photo of your face and it recommends different types of products based on your, your, your all your different conditions, but also preference data. And it's primarily between the brand a retailer and the consumer and having a relationship with them but the whole peer-to-peer -peer thing to us is probably, to, uh, as I look at the industry, that is a incredible opportunity where brands can still inject themselves, but maybe not like control of the, uh, you know, the CRM aspect of it to get a little geekier because you want to, you know, you want to have a relationship with the consumers, but also let them kind of relate to each other. Yeah, because you know this, we we can't, we listen more to our friends. You know, within every single group of friends, there's a, an influencer. There's that there's that person that has the best style or the best recommendations or the best cook, or whatever they are. Right. And, and people listen to them. And so I find when I'm, when I'm in a, an event with beauty counter and people are looking at products, it's not us telling them what they want is them telling each other that what works for them and what doesn't. And yeah. that's going to yeah, play, yeah. I think an increasingly important role in commerce. Yeah. Big media hasn't figured that out yet. It's still the broadcast, you know, you and I've been doing internet stuff for decades. It's just like, we're still in that flood them with advertising mode here, which is not uh, how about men's brands? You got to come out with some cool stuff for us. <laughs> you know, we've been we've help. been working on some things. Yes, <laughs> I'm sure you do. Well, first of all, I think that you know, I can debunk the myth about envelopes. We can also debunk the myth that men, men don't care about how they look because they do. You know, <laughs> they buy a whole lot of under eye, um, you know, uh, creams, eye creams. So when people say men don't care, they do. They do care, and they and I and again, I think when there's more also with gender fluidity and things that have been emerging over the last number of years uh, in, yeah. in the forefront yeah. of things, I think people are buying a lot more products. But yes, we you know we do currently have men's products um but we're kind of going to reboot that and um looking at you know a, a dream of mine would be to to bring to a more mass scale um some men's men's products that are genuinely clean simple multi-purposed and good for the environment so stay tuned on that we have, we do have some things that we're working on yeah, that's a great idea i mean most of the ones out there they're kind of macho marketing brands i know. Not necessarily like the best thing for you and um 
be. They're terrible. Well, you know, they're sorry to interrupt you, but I mean, I think that oh, I do please. think that men should understand this because I do think when when I started Beauty Counter and just the name beauty, men will oftentimes turn off. But the reality <laughs> is, when I'm talking about the need for cosmetic reform. We're talking about your shave cream, your deodorant, your body wash, all of the products that men are putting on their bodies every day. And, you know, there are a lot of scientists and Dr. Shana Swan, who's someone who's been an advisor to us and Uh, is is talking about how the large percentage of male sperm that is now defective. So men do need to start paying attention to what they're putting on their bodies as much as women do. It's, It's not a women's health issue. It's everyone's health issue. And everyone should be paying attention to this. I was talking to some guys the other night and, um, you know, I was talking about the beauty industry, which they were talking about. By the way, your, your point about when you mentioned beauty or the word counter, they usually run away because the ca- they're used to like walking through Nordstrom and people spraying them or maybe not Nordstrom. For sure. I run away I, from that too. <laughs> please don't spray me. I don't want to be sprayed by anything. I don't think they do that anymore. Yeah. Oh, gosh. But yeah, the whole, um, I said, you know why the body wash tub is so big in your shower? They're like, no, why? I'm like, so, so they can fit all the ingredients on the back here. <laughs> it's like, have you ever read this? Stuff? <laughs> I know it's I'm crazy. Like, it's uh yeah, but it makes me smell good. Anyway, um, enough about men. Um, what else? What else you guys got cooking? In terms what of else 20, we have? 22, 23, 24. Where do you see the company going? Well, um, I think we're hopefully moving towards world domination. But um, besides, no, I'm joking. I think that you know the next no, couple of years. I wouldn't I mean, joke I about that. that. I definitely. Uh, that. <laughs> no, I think. Look, I think we have we barely scratched the surface of what we can achieve. We know that the things that we've authentically stood for from day one are the things that today's consumer really cares about. I think that you know you can expect to see us continuing to amplify our multi-channeled approach. We believe in our own stores. We believe in our community of independent consultants. We believe in you know you know wholesale partnerships from time to time, which we've enjoyed with Target and Sephora and others over the years. I think international is an opportunity for us to kind of go beyond, you know, we're currently serving, you know, American and Canadian consumers, but we believe that the world needs to better understand what's going on out there. And that, you know, even in the European Union, where you have stricter regulations, they're nowhere near the the never list that we've created. And they're still a they're, small they're, list. Yep. Yeah. And it's, and it's, you know, our approach to, to um, clean is very comprehensive. And I think you're also gonna see us really focusing on you know, getting to the, to the root cause and creating systemic change across our industry and really, really focusing on sustainable and new types of materials for sustainable packaging because we know that the health of the earth is incredibly important to, to, to everyone and, and increasingly so. Yeah, I love that. And you've got a little extra time to work on that, which is, which is good because it's, it's a full-time job. All of that. Yes. Yeah, where, where, where I was really going with that was international. I just think it's a massive opportunity, as, as, as I'm sure your board already knows. Well, but yes, and Mark has great experience international, and he's French, so there you go. So we've already got, he, he's he international, does. and he's built international, and I think we've always wanted to, you know, we had planned pre-pandemic to, to get out of, the, you know, to, to go international, and then things yeah. slowed down, but we are absolutely going to hit the ground running beyond our borders. Yeah, and if you look at the true global brands like Shiseido and, and you know even you know Estee, um, it's it's just there's so many openings there to um, you know to to do your own thing and maybe even cooperate. So um, it's uh, looks like a great road ahead for you, Greg. I uh, you know really want to thank you for being on the program, of course. But a lot of people listening in who are running brands and startups and divisions of companies, all types of stuff, and you've you've kind of walked them through. You know, the exit doesn't have to be the exit. It can be the next growth phase, which is fascinating. Any advice that you give them just before we go about ones that are kind of in that scale up phase that you went through? I mean, yours was a long one. Well, first of all, I I think what you said a second ago is important. You know, there are, I think we people are always focusing on the end game, right? The liquidity event. And I think that's important because most companies have shareholders that expect a return on their investment. But I think that, first of all, I would say, you know, focus on the long game and how to build an incredible company that the, the money and the liquidity will come. And I do think it can come in a phased approach. There's not necessarily like one Super Bowl that you're working towards, but actually if you build an incredible organization that has a significant enterprise value and you're looking towards the long game, I think we oftentimes get so caught up in the immediate that we're not thinking about where could this organization be in one, three, five years. And you don't have all the answers, but I I do believe we should be playing the long game and making sound business decisions for that. Um, And I think that also just, um, you know, for me, it's to, to, to stay the course 
You know, I think so often entrepreneurs and high growth companies get distracted. They get um, influenced by the last conversation that they've had or their boards or whatever. And I think that, you know, if you stay the course and you stay true to what you set out to do in the beginning, your business will be far more successful than if you flip flop and you listen to every single person that comes along or every single trend that emerges because that may not be right for your brand. So, you know, that's what I've been trying to do is look, look long-term, try to figure out, you know, how to maximize what we started knowing that there are a lot of opportunities coming our way all the time, but trying to focus on, on the end game, which is to change the world and get safer products into people's hands. I love that. For a minute there, I thought you were talking about me and all the mistakes I've made. That's so <laughs> well, I've made a lot too. Let me tell you, I'm, a good day is when I don't make the same mistake twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take it in a week at least. Well, thanks, Greg. I really appreciate it. You've been listening to Greg Renfrew, who is the founder and now executive chair of Beauty County. This is Dean DeBias with the Reboot Chronicles. We really want to thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Yeah, take care. <laughs>